morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, a new activity here at STEMnet. Uh, we were fortunate to have received some nice funding from uh, from SoCal Gas, and uh, this year we were able to support three students across the CSU uh, to do some summer research uh, in their respective campuses. And just like we have had in the past faculty come and do research, uh, talk about their research in what we call our virtual research cafes, and we've been running them uh, since pretty much COVID started, we thought, why don't we give opportunity to some of our students uh, to share their work uh, throughout the CSU? Uh, just like faculty oftentimes are not able to uh, work across or talk across other CSU campuses, we thought we'd give opportunities to students too, because they will be our uh, our replacements one day if they so choose to go into uh, higher education. So we would, of course, like to start it off now with our first speaker. And um, my screen just has too many open windows right now. And I think I have it here somewhere. Our first speaker, Hello. Lee Nichols, by all means, you're on the, not the hot seat, the cool seat. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Gomez. Hello, everybody. Let me pull up the show. All right. So hello, everybody. My name is Cody Nichols, and today I will be discussing the research that we did here at Cal State Dominguez Hills this summer, optimizing the therapeutic using high resolution optical tweezer laser scanning confocal microscopy or LSCM. Oh, looks like I got a click. I'm sorry. So imagine having the power to capture, manipulate, and alter objects at will, all by the power of light, as if it were merely a toy in the hands of a god. This technology is surprisingly not one of science fiction, but in a micro reality near you. These optical traps, also referred to as optical tweezers, are advanced laboratory tools that can be used to manipulate microorganisms by using the momentum of light through varying laser frequency. We wouldn't be where we were, where we are at now, without Arthur Ashkin. Throughout the GI Bill through after World War II, he graduated with a PhD at Cornell University, and then in the 1970s, submitted papers to the physical review letters that laid the foundation to a laser trap. Years later, in 2018, he won the Nobel Prize in Physics for this very technology, also being the world's oldest recipient of the prize. We can use optical tweezers, or OTs, to manipulate subjects such as molecules, neutral atoms, or even DNA, making optical tweezers vital in biophysics research. Some examples that Ashkin had trapped were the tobacco mosaic virus and E. coli, where in our research, we focused on breast cancer cells. To simplify the physics, we form a tightly focused laser with a lens at a high numerical aperture into a dielectric sphere that has a higher index of refraction than its surrounding media. Then that sphere can be trapped. A wide variety of subjects can be fused to these spheres or the subject itself can be trapped with more careful consideration. While the media itself is usually water, it can also be air. Seen here are some of the forces enacted on a dielectric sphere when off-center in a Gaussian laser. You can see that the gradient force uh, recenters the bead with the help of the lens. And when in the beam waste, the gradient force is in balance with the scattering force. And this is all just from the momentum of light. In this second image here are just some force momentum reactions of the laser, uh, showing that if we were to displace the sphere, it always snaps back in the beam waste, just kind of like a rubber band. So throughout the summer, we have been building a trap here in the biophysics lab. At the forefront is an eight watt pulse laser firing in 10 nanosecond pulses, emitting 20 joules a second. The output wavelength of interest is 1064 nanometers, exiting at four millimeter beam diameter. 
we split and dump the additional 732 nanometer beam into the beam dump just adjacent to it. These dichroic mirrors are specially made to sustain the energy of the laser uh, while also redirecting the beam. Uh, polarizers allow us to dump some of the energy of the laser as well because eight watts is just a little bit too much for biological samples. Uh, we also have a beam expander here, uh, which approximately expands our beam diameter to 20 millimeters. And then we have some lenses. These lenses are used to adjust the beam waist of our laser. We plan on placing the beam waist inside of our confocal microscope so that way we can trap some biological samples of our own. The confocal microscope allows us to take three-dimensional imaging of our samples, as well as uh, being able to uh, capture refractive index is, as well. Uh, this, uh, the live feed will be connected to, from the microscope, will be connected into a computer where we'll be able to manipulate and move everything just from the computer itself. Here is a, just an early test image just to show you the cool electric green color of the 732 nanometer laser that we uh, dumped. This was just an early test run of the laser, but I thought it would be a cool addition. On the right-hand side uh, is the confocal microscope. It's where in the future we will trap, manipulate, and analyze some biological samples. Uh, throughout the summer, we had some trial and error through the assembly, and the trap has unfortunately not yet been accomplished here at our biophysics lab. So during the construction of the lab, we took some data from our sister lab at Middle Tennessee State University. The setup seen to the right is very similar to the one that we are setting up here at Cal State Dominguez Hills. The study that we pulled from has been going on since 2018 in which BT20 breast cancer cells are being optically trapped in slides with micro magnets. The goal is to was to find the threshold ionization energy period of these cells as to non-invasively eradicate breast cancer cells if they were found naturally. But by trying to find a way to annihilate these breast cancer cells, something peculiar happened in the trap resembling something celestial in nature. Uh, what was seen was the formation of a dark space, then a burst of star-like radiation. When checked, this occurs whether or not the magnets are in the trap. However, when the magnets are in the trap, they accelerate towards the boundary and increase the size as well. Due to this behavior, we believe that the dark space acts as a dielectric. In the top image seen here, uh, we see the dark region grow and contract as we turn the laser on and off. The white dots throughout the slides are actually the micromagnets, and you can see as it grows, the micromagnets accelerate to the boundary of the dark space. After reaching a critical point, the dark region explodes into a plasma, incinerating everything in the slide. This process itself, as stated earlier, seems very similar to that of a star formation, which is similar, or which is an interstellar cloud gathering and forming an insulating dark region, not allowing energy or light to escape until the temperature raises exponentially and then boom, a protostar forms from the immense pressure. And this is almost exactly what's seen here. One of the blasts of radiation that was measured way back in 2018 was able to be read in the slide over three years later. Uh, in the bottom image seen here is the whole process itself. We see the dark region get to the critical point, explode into the star-like radiation. And at the bottom right, it almost resembles a star death, showing a faint red glow as if it were a red dwarf star. I understand that this is a lot to take in as well right now. Uh, cell implodes, becomes a star, and homogenizes the media as a plasma. Uh, well, just like anything perplexing in any discovery in science, the best thing we can do right now is just to take data and analyze it. So that was my job. Uh, right now, it's being speculated that this dark region uh, was possibly a micro black hole. Since everything accelerates to it, it acts like a vacuum and it bends the laser light around it. Uh, the main theory is that this happens due to the dipole oscillation inside the cell membrane. 
and also to the fact that it's a pulse laser. My job was to take screenshots of these times of interest, run it through MATLAB, and find the average intensity of these images. Uh, and these images came from a live feed recording from our sister lab at the Middle Tennessee State University. And the, oh, whoops. Oh man, that's not good. Oh, what? I'm so sorry. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in this diagram seen here, the y-axis is the power ratio between the transmitted power over the incident power. And we see that the power ratio is highest right when the star-like radiation is beginning to radiate out of the dark region. In this image seen here, the y-axis is still the power ratio. However, the y-axis is now the intensity. And as seen here, there's an exponential decay of the power ratio as the intensity gets higher. From here, all we can do is continue analyzing this phenomenon and get geared up because this might just open up a brand new book for the sciences. It goes without saying that this presentation wouldn't be made possible without the support of the 2022 STEMnet SoCal Gas Student Research Fellowship Program, as well as Dr. Krogman and Dr. Dang here from CSUDH as well as Dr. Lorenzo from MTSU. Thank you all for your time. And I hope you had just as much fun as I did. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Excellent. <laughs> we have a uh, standing room only crowd today for you, Cody. Great presentation. Uh, you certainly make not that it isn't, you make your research sound very, very exciting. You have a lot of enthusiasm. Great, thank you. Our next speaker is Connor Bartholomew from Cal State Fullerton. Connor. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, so my name is Connor Bartholomew, and over the summer, I worked on the wildfire detection project. Uh, oops, there we go. So uh, a little bit of an introduction, wildfires can become extremely destructive, uh, and if they're left unattended for too long, they become much harder to maintain. Um, so many wildfires are due to humans, but many are also out of control, are control and they just occur in nature. Um, so fires that start in these remote areas become harder to fight against as they start away from the human eye and are given time to propagate and grow to unmanageable levels. Uh, every year, they cause billions of dollars in damages, and they take significant manpower to maintain. Uh, some fires can take thousands of people going out and risking their lives to uh, just contain these fires. So they're extremely disruptive to people's everyday lives as well. They create very high stress situations uh, with evacuation orders and people may lose their homes um, and or their jobs. It, it creates very, very difficult situations. And as climate change continues to occur, these wildfires will only become more frequent and more destructive. So some statistics, in 2021 alone, there were roughly 59,000 different fires that burned 7.1 million acres across the United States. And California has it especially bad when it comes to wildfires due to our long droughts and uh, high levels of vegetation, which create very, uh, which create very dry conditions. Uh, so in California, 2.2 million uh, of those 7.1 million acres uh, were burned. Uh, which is around, roughly 3.1, uh, 3 or 31.3% of the total acres, acres burned across the United States. And just to suppress the fires in 2021, uh, it costed nearly $4.4 billion. So that doesn't include damages. That is just the manpower and uh, resources being expended to suppress these fires. So there's a very real need for fast, reliable detection of these fires so that their impact can be mitigated. So some detection efforts that are happening so all over the planet, there's companies and individuals that are working together on their own wildfire detection. And here in California, we have Alert Wildfire. So Alert Wildfire was invented by Graham Kent at the University of Nevada, Reno. It is, uh, there are now three universities that are working together, the University of Nevada, Reno, the University of Oregon, and the University of California, San Diego. So Alert Wildfire is a network of fire cameras that allow firefighters to monitor remote areas and verify the existence of fires. So on their phones or computers, they can go to the Alert Wildfire website and uh, look through the eyes of the camera themselves and zoom in and see if there's a fire going on in the area. 
There's over 700 cameras that are monitoring across six different states, and 300 of those cameras are in California. However, the, this has a couple of downsides. As these cameras are quite expensive to manufacture, and it requires teams to go out to these locations and build the tower them, towers themselves. Um, and it also still requires human verification. Like uh, in the bottom right corner, you see a fire tower. Uh, like normal fire tower is how people used to have to go out it, uh, into these remote locations themselves and monitor for fires. Um, they, it can now be done from the safety of their home with alert wildfire. So the goals of, our, of the wildfire detection project, Dr. Ankita Moapatra, Timothy Trin, and I uh, work, were working on developing an unmanned sensing node that is capable of monitoring remote areas and alerting responders in the event that a fire breaks out. Uh, so using the ESP32, we configured both the PMS5003 and BME280 to collect our data. And then using MQTT, we published that data over the internet and uh, to be collected by a separate device. Um, and this is ideal since the node will be I, uh, low cost and it will be pre-built, so it will be quick to set up uh, out in these remote locations. So why are we using the ESP32? Uh, specifically, we're using the ESP32 S3 Room-1. It's an Extensa 32-bit LX7 CPU that runs up to 240 megahertz, and it has two cores, uh, Core 0, which is the Pro CPU, and Core 1, which is the Application CPU. Um, it's low cost, low power. It's a low cost, low power board that has many different peripherals and other components all on the board itself, uh, including SPI, I squared C, ADC, UART. Uh, it also has Wi Fi and Bluetooth capabilities. There's 45 GPIOs, so general purpose inputs outputs, which are uh, essential for all of the sensors and external components that we're configuring. And it has eight megabytes of flash memory, which is plenty enough for any code that we're writing to the board. So the sensors that we're using. Uh, we're using the PMS5003 air quality sensor by Plant Tower. It's used to sense uh, concentration of particulates in the air, so particulate matter, PM1.0, PM2.5, and PM10, which is obviously good for smoke. So if uh, fires create a lot of smoke, it, and it'll, it sucks in that smoke, and it outputs just how much is in the air. We're also using the BME280, which is a humidity sensor by Bosch. It's used to sense temperature, humidity, and barometric, uh, barometric pressure. Uh, what is MQTT? Uh, stands for Message Queuing Telemetry Transport, uh, so the MQ. Uh, it's a lightweight messaging protocol that's optimized for low bandwidth, and it's uh, capable of sending data between devices, so device-to-device -device communication. Um, in our case, we're sending data from our ESP32 to a separate PC or a laptop uh, in some key terms. Broker, so a broker is a, essentially a server that receives the messages being sent to it uh, and then distributes them out to whoever is uh, trying to access them. So a client and a client is anything that is connecting to the broker. So the sensing node and the receiving device are both clients connecting to the MQTT broker. Um, and then a topic is a place where the data is being sent to within the MQTT broker. As you can see, the sensing node is publishing uh, to the topic data in the MQTT broker. And a publisher is anything that's sending data to the broker. Uh, under a topic. And then a subscriber would then subscribe to the that topic, and then the broker sends out that data to the subscribe device. So, and some cool things about MQTT is that you can have multiple receiving devices set up to the same topic. So you could have a, co a computer, a laptop, and or even a phone all connected to the same uh, all subscribing to the same topic, and they would all receive the, the the data from the sensing node. And then you can even have multiple sensing nodes set up and publishing to the same topic, and then those receiving devices will receive all of that data that is being sent to it. Um, and then, of course, you can also send data to individual topics. Um, and then, so that, as you can see, we have uh, it's publishing the data topic data one, topic data two, topic data three. And then the receiving devices are subscribing to the, each individual topic, so they would be receiving the data then. So our data, we so in our data or for our code, we create two tasks: one to initialize the sensor, and another to generate data, uh, or to initialize the sensors and generate data, and another to send the data through MQTT. So that's what you see in the flowchart here. It starts the program. It generates a task called or creates a task called generate reading. And that task initializes the BME280 on I squared C and PMS5003 on UART, where it then generates the sensor data and sends the data to the queue. 
And then another task is created called MQTT publication, where it starts the Wi-Fi on the board. And then it checks if the sensor data has received, any, or if, if, if the queue has received anything, or has received any sensor data. And if it has, then it publishes that data to the topic it subscribes to. And if it hasn't, then it just waits until it does. Uh, so that in the, the uh, picture in the middle there, uh, you can see the sample uh, output in our terminal. So it, the sensors are generating uh, the following data from our tasks or from the generate reading task. And then the MQTT publication task picks that up, it connects to the connects to the client, and then it sends the data out by it subscribes to the client and then publishes that data. And it does then it continues to do that. And then using Python, I created a receiver that subscribes to our topic and it places all of the data that's being received into a CSV file, which is what you see down in the bottom picture. But uh, it's connect it's connecting to the MQTT broker. So it's subscribing to the client or the subscribing to the topic. And it receives the following data from the broker and then it places it, it would place it into a CSV file. And then using uh, Python, I also created code to read from the CSV files and plot their data among the separate categories. And uh, we ran some small tests uh, with our sensors to observe how quickly they reacted to changes in the environment. So that's what you see on the right there. Um, the y axis is the level of particulates in the air, and the x axis is the number of samples taken. So uh, around a thousand samples, I lit a match and extinguished it, and it, which created a lot of smoke. And you can see the almost immediate spike in the uh, particulate uh, concentration in the air, which then it goes back down as the gas as the smoke kind of diffuses. So some future plans that we have. I plan to continue working on this project for the fall 2022 semester. Uh, I will work on implementing a lower gateway to send our collected data from multiple nodes to one central node. And then from there, we will have the central nodes send that data out to uh, servers through either Zoom link or cellular, cellular. And we will eventually create a casing to hold solar panels and batteries for long-term installation in remote, in remote areas. So we have a fully fledged working prototype that can be uh, installed in uh, these locations. And we are also looking into the BME 680 uh, to collect volatile organic compounds, VOCs, which are released from wildfires. So that would be uh, gases like uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, which will hopefully further increase our accuracy when it comes to detecting these fires. Uh, and once again, of course, I would like to thank STEMnet and SoCal Gas for this opportunity. It has been a very uh, unique experience for me, and I feel like I've learned a lot that I wouldn't have normally uh, outside outside or outside of my classes. So thank you. Thank you, Connor. Very very interesting talk, and certainly given the uh, issues we have here in the state of California with fire, uh, it's very apropos. Uh, for all of us to hear about this. So thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Justin Self from Cal Poly Slow. Justin. Hey, everybody. Um, just want to say thank you for the opportunity. And I'm excited to present this research today. So I am a third year student at Cal Poly um, San Luis Obispo. I transferred in from a community college and I started working right away on research. Um, I was really excited to do something uh, additional to my coursework that I didn't want to do too much, but I did want to do something. So I found out about research. And so uh, I am the only student working on this project right now, but I am uh, my advisor is Dr. Nadesh Hirmat. And uh, our title, I'm just going to go down our title here real quick so that it's not too, uh, too, too wordy here. So, and, and, and also, by the way, my assumption is that the audience is from a wide range of uh, of technical or non-technical background. And so I'm going to try to keep it somewhere in the middle and somewhat balanced. So just bear with me here. So virtual aperture, multispectral imaging. Essentially what we're doing here, um, you can see there's an image on the right of this kind of cool looking modern aircraft. Basically what we're doing is um, we want to take these drones, if you will, and I want to have them fly maximum distance apart as far as I can get them to fly apart, uh, looking up into the upper atmosphere and watching 
re-entry either debris or build debris, or I'm targeting CubeSats. You know, I'm, I'm talking um, a small satellites that are on their way down. So that's the virtual aperture. Virtual aperture means you take something and you, you put these two cameras essentially really, really far apart. Later, we're going to stitch the images together and hopefully we're going to get uh, a resolution that better um, that is going to be better than each one of those can be by themselves. We'll stitch them together post-production and get a really good image from two, two objects. So that's virtual aperture. Multispectral imaging means we're going to do infrared. Um, you know, you might have seen some pictures from Hubble Space Telescope or some of these other space telescopes where they get images, not just in the visible spectrum, but also in X-ray or in um, infrared in some cases. So we're going to do the same thing. Um, atmospheric reentry studies using high altitude reflective arrays. So I want to start out by saying that uh, my part in this work is, uh, I'm going to go ahead and click over here. My my part in this work is the theoretical background and you know kind of the feasibility studies on these on this type of system, um, not the implementation of the actual craft themselves. That's actually somebody else's um, job at another university. So what I want to show with this slide is on the right side you see just a paper. So this is a paper that Dr. Hirma and I um, are working on. Uh, I've presented it uh, recently at an AIAA, which is an aerospace uh, engineering conference um, here in California, and we are uh, we've been getting great feedback from from professors, from researchers, from from people in the industry about this type of idea. It's kind of far fetched, but we're really we're making we're really happy with slow progress. You know, a little bit here, a little bit there. So this is really really exciting, really long range stuff. But we we are working on a paper to actually get it into a journal. So generally, what I'm what what my, our, our objectives are are to propose a synthetic aperture optical system that will provide high resolution infrared imaging. So why do we care about these things? Basically, it's about imaging hypersonic activity, right? We can build a hypersonic wind tunnel, and that's great. And there are many universities that do so, and and that's all good. And we want to do that. However, uh, we also want to provide an opt an optical asset that will be able to image objects in real life conditions and not just laboratory conditions. Um, I wanna see these things coming in at hypersonic velocities and I want, we wanna see how they're breaking up under real world conditions. So why not be able to do the hypersonic research in the real world with you know, objects that are already coming in hypersonic and I don't have to you know, build the system and try to get it to mimic a real world uh, you know, a complicated system. Why not just image this thing happening? So this has been done before with specifically the shuttle um, program. Um, but a lot of the data out there is classified and uh, is not open for public domain. So what I'm doing is uh, we're we're kind of doing it from the ground up. Um, but I do have a staff advisor, um, a, um, a former faculty advisor who who uh, I'll acknowledge at the end. But he worked with the Naval Research Laboratory um, for thirty something odd years, and so he he likes to remind me that my research has already been done before. It's just that nobody else knows about it. Great, thanks, man. Um, so essentially, the, the 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 main point of the paper was that uh, if we if we fly these things at a distance of like nineteen thousand kilometers, which is between Japan and off the uh, west coast of the United States, which is where these things will be flying, if we can do that, we're going to have a ridiculous, powerful um, resolution. So basically, the paper just points that out, and we go through the math in the paper and say, hey, if this thing could work, um, we would actually produce really high resolution imaging. And so again, uh, that was a really simplified paper, really high level view of the situation. So that, that leads us to summer, okay? Now I wanna start uh, asking some more realistic questions and okay, sure, 19,000 kilometers looks like it would work really far out, but what about all the other like million details of this project? So I'm just starting to go down the line and ask some more realistic questions. So the first question was, what is the maximum distance that the high altitude FLTs, that's the name of the little drones, can be from each other uh, and still observe the same reentry event at the same time. And so the basic idea is that the Earth has a horizon, right? <laughs> and when I draw a line and I say 19,000 kilometers, in reality, there's a horizon, there's a curvature. So we take into account the curvature, we do the math, and you know, unfortunately, they can't be infinitely far apart. Too bad. We'd have infinite resolution. It'd be awesome. Uh, but basically, what it shows is that at the flight altitudes that we're talking about, um, we have a field of view that's roughly, and I have it here, uh, between 1,250 kilometers and 2,500 kilometers. So right there, it cuts our initial guess down quite a bit. And so this is all in preparation for actually building something with real sensors. So great. But the object is coming down, right? 
this thing is changing with time. So how do I handle that? Um, it's not just one distance. I have to understand the whole system and how the curvature and the spinning and, and, and the moving object. And so it's all this crazy stuff. So one bite at a time, right? So my second question is, how does velocity and position change during a reentry event? And so this is the question that I really sought out to answer um, throughout this summer's research. So very similar to Cody, where you're using MATLAB, and also like Connor, where he's developing his own code, I basically did the same thing. I used MATLAB to create my own code um, to model um, a CubeSat reentry system. So think of it like this. Like if you have, if you're going to skip a rock across the top of a pond, if you throw it too fast, um, you're going to skip, boom, boom, right? It's going to skip across the top and it's just going to keep going until it loses its um, momentum and it will drop. So that's the idea with a skipping object in Earth's atmosphere. We can try to image those, but what we're focusing on is the objects that actually come straight down and just burn right up like a fireball. So that would be like you throw the water, the, the rock into the water, trying to skip it, but you don't give it enough velocity. And so it just bloop, you know, total fail. Well, that's the same thing with an object coming in from space at a high velocity, and it comes into the atmosphere with such a high angle that it just burns the thing up. That's what I'm focusing on, okay? And so what I created was this plot, and this makes intuitive sense, but it needs validation. All I want you to take away from this plot is the fact that height on the y-axis um, starts out at our test height. You know, I'm saying, okay, 120,000 uh, meters or 120 km, great. It starts out there, which is good, and then it ends lower right? It, it goes on a curve. And so as time goes on, it goes down. That's a good thing. Like that's a gut check for me. I'm like, okay, the code seems to be kind of working, right? It's going down. So that's where I am. There's a zero line in the middle. You see that that would show the surface of the, of the earth. So you can tell that my code doesn't care about that. It just keeps running this thing down. And it goes to the center of the earth. Again, we're at the be beginning of this thing. My next step on this is to validate the data. Um, I actually want to run this against some real CubeSat reentry data to see how close I am. So you'll see that kind of as a theme on this project. This next plot is the same thing. I just want you to look at the red line going from the left to the right. That's the velocity. So again, this is a good thing, right? We see velocity going up at a linear rate. And then at some point, you see about the 700 second mark. It, it's, it is also increasing, but at a lower rate. That's when the CubeSat uh, theoretically hits a thicker part of Earth's atmosphere. So again, I'm encouraged because it looks like the code seems to be modeling a real world situation. And Yes, velocity should be linearly um, increasing because, as we know, uh, you know, position, velocity, time, or position, velocity, and um, acceleration are related. And so, when you integrate acceleration, you should get a um, a linear system, um, such as what we see here. And 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 then when you integrate it again, you're going to get a curve with um, height. So I'm I'm happy to see that. So again, gut check is good. Uh, I need to validate this data with real reentry data. And so the final plot that I'm going to show you is this one. This is just velocity versus height. And what I want to point out is uh, what I put on the screen was a little note that shows right when the right when there's a change, it goes from height and velocity uh, relationship goes from like a parabolic situation to a linear uh, relationship. And so the interesting thing about that, what we found is, again, that does match up with a thicker part of Earth's atmosphere that shows that this thing is coming in. And like I said, it's like burning up. It's like going down below the surface of the water. So again, gut check. This is good. The velocity numbers um, are a little high. And again, the reason for this is because I, I haven't taken into account terminal velocity of an object. So uh, this code just basically assumes that this, this CubeSat is perfect. It's not going to burn up. It's not tumbling. Nothing's happening. And it just comes in and it just keeps accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. And there's no, no, I mean, I do take into account drag, but I don't take into account terminal velocity. So the next iteration of my code will include terminal velocity, which basically says that as the, the force due to drag is equal to the force of um, caused by the acceleration of the Earth's gravitational field. Once they equal each other, I'm not going to have any more acceleration. This thing is going to have a flat line on the velocity. So finally, um, again, we're building a, a better reentry model. These are the things that are on, are on my list, my to-do list. And uh, presenting findings you can see is at the bottom. That's um, an important part of our research is doing things like this and presenting and getting feedback. So uh, I'm also going to take into account um, heat flux and all that kind of fun stuff. But we can add to this, right? That's the idea here. So I do want to acknowledge Dr. Nadish Hirmat and the Cal Poly Aerospace Engineering Department. I want to um, highlight Professor Greg Adams. He has been a tremendous help for this entire time uh, with all this experience. And I'm so thankful to the SoCal Gas um, Research Fellowship. This is awesome. This has provided me the opportunity to cut back at work and focus on this type of, um, of research. So I'm really thankful for that. I'm also part of the Engaged Scholarship Program and the LSAMP Scholarship Program. Also, I'm so thankful. 
Um, and I also wanted to mention that I do have a grant with the National Science Foundation. And so you're welcome to email me. Hope that was interesting. And I would like to hear from some of you soon. Great. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, very interesting. I've heard a lot about uh, Cube's stats, stats uh, during my uh, three-year term here at the Chancellor's Office from a variety of uh, different faculty. So we'll now open it up to questions from the audience. Um, anybody who would like to ask a question or, and that is not limited to uh, the speakers can also ask questions of each other if you want, but just, uh, uh, you know, either raise your hand or unmute yourself or show, show your face, whatever you want and um, go to it. So uh, thanks, Frank. I really appreciate this. First of all, I just want to say awesome job, the three of you. I'm so glad that you're engaging in science, and this is a wonderful program to highlight what the different CSU campuses and their students are doing. Um, I, I, I don't have a specific, well, I do kind of have a specific question, but Cody, uh, we are looking into uh, applying for a grant to get a, a laser scanning uh, confocal microscope here on campus, and we just literally, Allison, who works in the dean's office with me uh, just sent out an email uh, to a variety of, of faculty members that might be interested in this. Are you currently in the stages of setting that up and building it uh, on your campus? Uh, and, and if so, what are some pitfalls or what are some successes or, uh, you know, because you, you did mention the Middle Tennessee connection and just if you could uh, say a few words about that, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so throughout the summer, we've been building this trap. Uh, actually, a little bit before the summer, we were doing a little bit of the trap building in the fall. Um, but some major uh, things that we uh, came across were sometimes we would say buy apart from Thor Labs, right? And they would give us the lens holder and what have you, but it wouldn't come with something to hold the lens holder. Or like maybe we would buy a base, you know? but it didn't come with any screws to put the optical posts through there. So uh, above and foremost, the most <laughs> uh, helpful advice I can give is to make sure that the parts that you're buying have like some recommendations on the side for parts that you might also need because you will need those parts. Um, if you're buying from Edmund Optics, Thor Labs or uh, Newport, all of them seem to have a, a, uh, a struggle with communication of saying, hey, you might also need this. Um, so there's a lot of times where we were buying stuff and we would get it and we just be like, wait, we need something else to even use this. It would put us back another week. So it was really uh, uh, frustrating at times, but luckily we had the sister lab and stuff. As of where we are right now, we are, trying to get the lenses to put the beam waste inside the confocal microscope right now. So we're on the very last stages of it. Um, we had some problems with the confocal microscope as well, just due to it being in the area, we have to give it a deep clean and stuff like that. So it can give us a more accurate reading. Once we do that, we can get the lenses in there and hopefully trap some stuff by the end of the semester. Uh, but uh, yeah, best, best heads up is, uh, Cross, cross your T's, dot your I's with all the pieces that you're buying, because my goodness, that was a, a roller coaster. <laughs> I hope that <Thanks>. helps. <laughs> it does. And, and thank you, Cody. I'm sure we'll be reaching out to you and other universities with confocal microscopes uh, to ask about uh, some issues and problems. And, and Connor, I'm sorry, Frank, I'm just going to continue if you don't mind. Uh, Connor, have you worked with uh, Cal Fire? Uh, in terms of this system, I mean, as we know, and we're in fire season now, we just went through a, a horrible heat wave. It, it's something that, you know, affects all of us. And and has CAL FIRE uh, been part of your discussions uh, with this? Uh, I don't believe so yet. Um, we're, we're still just in the kind of uh, design phase of this project. Uh, so we're still working on configuring sensors and figuring out exactly what sensors we want to use. Uh, like I said, we're looking into the BME 680, which has a gas sensor. Um, and we just have to play around with it, and just figure out what works best for us. Um, 
we also said we have to figure out the power usage and everything. Um, I don't believe, yeah, I don't believe Cal, we've we've worked with Cal Fire yet. Um, but we might in the future. We'll just have to see how the project continues. Yeah, thank you. Because that's, of course, the implementation phase, right? Uh, to, to make it real, to make it happen, to make all the right. hard work that you've done, both theoretically and through coding. Uh, and, and it's really important work. And Justin, the same goes for you. I mean, it's just like the re-entry problem is a major problem for a, a variety of things, and not just the aerospace industry, uh, but just things out in the in the you know in space coming into the Earth's atmosphere as it is. Now you've been working out on a theoretical level. Uh, are are you working with folks that are implementing these uh, the, the, the some of the models that you're developing? Yeah. So I didn't mention that in the presentation. But this whole idea is actually a piggyback off of a current project called the Glitter Belt. And this is from a professor out of, he's formerly from Georgia Tech. I think he's retired now, but it's actually to reverse global warming. Like his, he's got this huge vision for, you know, that's why there's reflective sheets. You know, I don't care about reflective sheets for optics, but I'm, you know, I'm piggybacking off that project. So that's the whole concept. So kind of, yes, the answer is yes, through that avenue. Um, and yes, this is definitely a multidisciplinary work. Uh, at this point, though, it's it's mostly theoretical on my end to come up, you know, we're working on the concepts, working on the feasibilities, we are going to start building some test models and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, the answer is sort of, uh, and, and we're building towards that, uh, but definitely through the connection of um, uh, of our friend out of Georgia Tech. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, the three of you, you made my Friday, awesome stuff. Great, we have a uh, question a couple of questions actually uh, from somebody from uh, Slow. And the first question is oftentimes asked. The second question is not often asked uh, from Dr. Jane Lure there. Uh, what recommendations do you have to research mentors based on your experience? You know, we, it'd be interesting to hear what advice students can give to people that are mentoring them rather than, you know, students. <laughs> Uh, the other way. This goes to all three of you. I'll ask a clarifying question. Is this a, does this question asking what recommendations do we have as a student to research a mentor for ourselves, you know, finding a mentor? Or is the question like, what recommendation, recommendations do I have for the, the research mentors? Everyone's nodding. Is that second the, one? The latter. Okay. No, your mentors. Okay. Yeah, I guess since I'm talking, I can speak to that. Uh, what recommendations do I have? I think, so I'll use my experience with Dr. Nandesh Hirmat. Uh, he, you know, I'm glad that we had rapport. Like, I'm glad that he and I were able to spend some time together building rapport because at some point in the project, you know, he throws me literally to the wolves. He's like, okay, figure it out. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, like, as a student, some of the stuff you, you we have no concept. We, you know, the, I think for me, it's like having the mentor remember what it was like to be a student, you know, remembering the fact that like, yeah, like you can learn all the calculus, the differential equations and stuff. But then when you go out to do this stuff in real life, I'm not using that much calculus. My code doesn't even use calculus. I wanted to, but my software developer friend looked at my original code and was like, why are you doing this? And I'm like, I don't know. That's what I know. And he's like, dude, and, and he showed me how to do it. And it was like, plus one you know what i mean like really elementary simple stuff and you just do it a million times so stuff like that where it's like as students we're we feel like we're so smart with all this calculus and you know integral integral calculus and whatever you know you want to your, your field talks about we're so up on it but then when you go to implement it sometimes it's a lot simpler sometimes it's it's thinking about it in a different way and i think bridging that gap from the mentor to the student um, would be helpful like hey this is what real research looks like it doesn't always look like what your textbook problems are and uh, I, I found that that to be helpful. So, so Nandish was awesome in that, where he played both sides a little bit. He kind of let me struggle for a little while, but he was always there to help. And um, and that was it's been wonderful. So, that's my thought. My research advisor once told me the most brilliant ideas are the most simplest. And I think you know why make something more difficult than it really needs to be. Uh, so when you said you know I don't need to use calculus, it's just plus one, one and one is two. I mean. You want to, the, the easiest route is the one one should choose. How about you, Cody or Connor? Any comments? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I would agree with Justin. Sometimes, you know, you as, as you would say, you build a rapport, you get thrown to the wolves, and then you get a separate perspective, and then you realize maybe it doesn't need to be this hard. You know, work smarter, not harder, right? So uh, I, I would say maybe the same, just uh, an increased awareness perspective, just to always remember where you came from, because uh, as you build knowledge, it's always important to humble yourselves, because <laughs> sometimes we can... Uh, you know, I make too much of something that could be simpler. Like uh, why do an impossible integral when you could do a plus one for Justin's example, you know? Um, but the, honestly, I, I was having trouble thinking of anything else. So like, I just wanted to piggyback on what he said. That's honestly probably the only thing I could offer. <laughs> uh, so I would probably I'll chime in. Um, I would say communicate with your student. Um, when I, when I initially started this project, I started this project last semester in around March. Um, and when I started, I was kind of just running around in circles, not really working on anything because I didn't know what to do. Um, but then I reached out to Dr. Moapatra and we talked and uh, as, as things progressed, uh, we communicated and uh, talked about what I should be working on exactly. And that kind of helps give a framework of how to progress. That's great. You know, in, in the CSU, you know, we always pride ourselves on, on being a little, a lot different than say some other systems. And it, instead of looking at, uh, you know, the glass half empty and this deficit model, you know, what are the, the, the cultural positive capital that students bring to the table that can be integrated in their learning experience? And it's a two-way street that yes, students are learning from their mentors and in the classroom, the same thing, but a lot of faculty uh, need to be taught too by students because it's been a long time since they were students. And sometimes those that do not keep up on pedagogical changes, um, uh, I'm not saying they have to you know, do TikTok on the side, but I think you go where I'm saying, okay. Any more questions? Well, I certainly like to thank all three of you and certainly everyone who came here. Also, I would like to thank Jillian Wright, uh, Vice President at uh, SoCal Gas, who serves on the CSU Foundation for providing uh, funds, not only to this program, but for a number of years, SoCal Gas, as well as a lot of big corporations who sit on the foundation uh, to support our students uh, going forward. You know, I do know Jill, Jillian, I do know her husband. It's wonderful that her husband actually has a PhD in chemistry from Harvard. So it's good to know that uh, maybe there's a, a little push on that other side uh, in uh, you know, having a, a STEM-based spouse uh, helps and helps the CSU going forward. This program will be offered again. We will get the solicitation out earlier and uh, because it was a little delayed, uh, not, on, not because of me and I won't point fingers as to why, but um, uh, we will offer it to the seven campuses that are within the SoCal gas region down here in uh, Southern California. So it, uh, the information will be forwarded to your respective provosts, hopefully by year's end. Um, also, and hopefully uh, those who are admins out there, uh, you, uh, we do have another call that went out oh, about a month and a half ago that went to the AVPs for research and all of your provosts. That is a combination, the uh, trying to look at synergies between STEM and the non-STEM areas. Uh, so hopefully that has filtered down to your respective, uh, you know, areas, you know, deans. Uh, if not, please send me an email and I could send that directly to you because uh, not all provosts uh, listen and I'm being very uh, careful there. You know, they're very, very busy and I get it, which is why we send it to AVPs also for research, okay? So with that, I certainly like to thank uh, all of you and certainly to, you know, Cody, Justin, and Connor for really doing exemplar research uh, during the summer and uh, certainly 
good luck to all of you, the three of you, wherever your, uh, your future lies. May it be in a STEM field, uh, perhaps coming back to take our places one day, or maybe going out in the industry. So thank you. Have a pleasant day, everyone. Goodbye.